All right, well, let's hit the gavel and we will open up this meeting of the City of Sandy Planning Commission. And this is Monday, November 27th, 2023 at 6.30 in the evening. And we will begin with a roll call. I'll open some. Okay, Commissioner Wegener. Here. Commissioner Pullen. Here. Commissioner Weinberg. Here. Commissioner Ramsayer. Here. Commissioner Myram. Absent. Uh, Commissioner Vincent. Yes. And Chairman Crosby. Here. And then I also noticed that Council uh, Liaison Maiden is on as well. Yes. Okay, we had minutes in the packet. I don't have the dates on the agenda here. I forget what it was last month. Any uh, corrections? Anything's noted on the minutes that were in the packet? I noticed that this morning that I didn't put the date, which I always do. So yeah. I threw you a curveball, I guess. So what was it, October? It was September 25th. September. Okay, nothing nothing heard, no comments, and we will deem them approved as presented to September 25, 2023 minutes. <clears throat> we'll go ahead with the go through the formalities here, give opportunity for any requests from the floor, anybody who is in the room um, virtually. If you have any comments to uh, make to the Planning Commission tonight for non-agenda items, now is your time to speak up. And if you're on Zoom, click the raise hand button, wait to be recognized. If you're on telephone, dial star nine to raise your hand and then wait to be recognized. You don't have any attendees. Okay. That's kind of what I suspected. All right, we'll move to the director's report that was in the packet. Any um, questions for Kelly or comments, or clarifications? I appreciate it. Yeah, just so you know, we're going to try to at least quarterly have um, code enforcement updates for development services. So that'll be a new addition that you'll see on a quarterly basis, um, similar to what was in the packet tonight. Uh, we'll continue to have conference plan updates uh, as we progress to the finish line, hopefully the first half of next year. Um, obviously the current planning, which is less than it typically is because of the moratorium. And then I was gonna explain that um, on, I didn't put this in the report, but I was gonna just give a couple minute update on it. As I believe you know from an email I sent, I want to say two weeks ago, uh, that on November 20th, the city council did approve a new resolution to extend the moratorium another six months. We're currently working with, we did all our stress test analysis. Um, it's all been submitted to the EPA and DQ. I think there was over 3,000 pages submitted. And they've actually, within about 45 days, turned around comments to us, which was pretty fast, honestly they had to go through a 3,000 page document. Mm -hmm. um, and they have about 30 pages of comments, I think, that now our public works department, the engineering firms we've hired are working closely with EPA and DQ to kind of resolve those outstanding questions or potential issues. And so we anticipate that hopefully that will only take a couple months. And then we're hopeful that in the first quarter of 2024, we'll have an updated number of ERUs and if we can modify the moratorium further. We're not we're we're not at a point at this point based on preliminary analysis where we're going to altogether lift the moratorium. Um, but we are hopeful based on the analysis, the preliminary analysis that we're not only going to have a lot more ERUs that but that potentially the moratorium could be modified so that there's some limited land use permits that could be submitted as well. Um, and that's what I've been sharing with people in the public. We don't know the exact timing and we don't know the numbers yet because that's that's kind of what's being negotiated between our engineers and, and the federal government now. And when does that six month extension take it to? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So even though they did it on November 20th, it was actually for the extension that occurs on November on December 20th. So they just did it like a month early. So 
if there's no decision or the analysis not kind of negotiated, it could go out to June 20th, 2024. I don't anticipate it will. Like that's not what we're anticipating at this point. So on your report on DeBarco Road on the house edition, is that the house at the corner of DeBarco and Bluff? Yeah. It is, that's correct, oh, yeah. okay. I thought I saw something earlier about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's, you know, there's a retaining wall built really close to the creek. I think based on some evaluations that have been done by some engineers is that we think it's fine to stay there. In fact, if you if you removed it, it might actually do more damage at this point since it's been there for like 30 years or 25 years or whatever. Yeah. Um, there are some other improvements like a shed and some turf and some other th stuff that will have to be removed because that's where eventually the trail will go through. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, and that's what I tried to express the, to the builder there is unfortunately when they plotted that lot, and I think Jerry, you, you have a, his, you know what happened yeah. here. They kind of that one lot on the end, they kind of really squeezed in there. And so where that individual's house is, there's just not much distance to their back property line and where where the creek is. Um, like now, if we were plotting that subdivision, that last lot most likely would have never been allowed to be platted. Well, my my house wouldn't be your house be probably the same thing, yeah. Yeah. But your house, the difference is like the trail goes away from your house. So there's plenty of room to put uh -huh. the trail back in there. Down by this individual's house, unfortunately, the city only owns like a 15 foot linear swath through there. So there's, there's nowhere else to put the trail. Um, if there was, we'd likely be working with the property owner to sell them some property and, and go down that road instead. Because we've done that with other people where we have a really wide area that we can put a trail, but unfortunately, that's just not the case there. So. Yeah. How's the, how would that trail is a little bit off subject? It would end up on the get up on the up on the road. Up on it, the it would, yeah. And then down the sidewalk. Yeah, so you'd still you'd still come out at least for now to the corner across down, mm -hmm. but instead of going out in front of that bank of i don't know what it is five or six houses you could you could if you chose chose to stay on the trail and go behind them by the creek essentially and that that's what's been kind of a long-term vision and it's in the parks master plan that way yeah okay well thank you so much yeah um, is there an update on the december meeting at all um for planning commission yeah i mean at this point i don't have anything that we would have on it um the hard part always with the december one with when you guys meet too is it's always right at christmas basically <laughs> so like in years past we have had like a meeting some years and it's like in the middle of the month i know yeah move it up earlier yeah mm -hmm. um but i at this point i don't have anything you do have a work session next monday with the council on fair and or on housing policies and the HNA. And then in January, you will have the clear and objective audit to review and give a recommendation to council. But I, I don't believe there'll be a, um, a January PC meeting. Or a, uh, I'm sorry, a December PC yeah. meeting. The fourth it's Sunday Christmas is Christmas dinner. Christmas. Yeah, <laughs> the Christmas dinner at City Hall. All right. Well, Commissioner Mayton is in the room. Any uh, any information to pass on to us, or do, does any of the commissioners have any questions of uh, city council? Well, hi, hi planning commission. Um, well, Kelly did a great job. I was just going to mention the moratorium extension that city council passed. He did a great job with it, so I can skip by that. Um, the only other thing I would bring up is that um, we were given a feasibility study on the community campus uh, annex building last week. So you know different. Um, configurations that annex building can be used into, which uh, will lead to future, uh, you know, building development in front of that when those other, you know, when the when the pool and, uh, gets taken down. But um, that's really it. And then my only plug-in would be uh, please get out there for the Sandy uh, Christmas tree lighting, which I believe is Friday night. Um, I'm pretty sure it's the first. I'll double check that before I get off. So, any questions for me? 
You just need a uh, red hat for the tassel. <laughs> so, uh, I'll save at the end of December. <laughs> so, and I do have a red hat in the other room. I'll go get it. <laughs> well, thank, thank you. you. All right. Well, we'll move right on to the uh, the new business is the uh, we're we'll go into a work session. It'd be kind of interesting to not have a formal public hearing tonight. So I'll turn it over to Patrick. Sure. And we will we'll go from there. Tell us what what we can do and help. So to, this is kind of picking back it up on what Kelly had, had just outlined a little bit of what's ahead of us. Um, and so I kind of just took a lot of those uh, upcoming events. Um, I know you guys have been uh, tapped into it as far as doing the work sessions, uh, joint work sessions with city council um, and kind of following what the consultants have been doing. And Kelly's, I'm sure, been keeping you updated uh, before I got here. And I'm saying that because I've only been here two months now. Um, but uh, um yeah, coming into this and seeing just kind of what's ahead of us and, and how much um, work that's already been done, kind of work that I think is coming to a close that um, uh, the consultants are putting together findings will help with the staff report and ultimately looking for um, your recommendation for these legislative um, agenda items going forward. We're going to have kind of a... Uh, you know, a, a busy, maybe even intense type schedule. Um, and at the same time, there's been a bunch of lingering code amendments that we've run into that um, we believe that, you know, is a good time to kind of start addressing these as we're, we're doing code amendments with a clear objective, kind of bring them all together um, and maybe kind of feather them in. Um, but Part of doing code amendments is sometimes they can be um, they can be really simple and kind of be addressed and um, amended relatively quickly. Some take a little bit more conversation, debate um, on where we're going. Um, and I think part of what we try to do here is um, look to you guys for a little bit of guidance and on, on how you want to, us to bring some of these items. Because uh, we could we can work on some of these and bring some of these very quickly. Um, some can be, I think, disposed of, discussed, and and um, and agreed upon relatively quickly. Some might go a meeting or two, such as um, outline the the sign ordinance um, or or chapter is quite long. There's quite quite a few amendments going on there. But, but smaller stuff like a retaining wall or a utility thing, we could even group some of those together. So I think what we're kind of what uh, me and Kelly have been talking about and, and asking is, is when we start to to um, schedule some of these things and we're looking at our housing needs analysis, and I know you've been keeping up with the work sessions, um, just getting some feedback on, on how you, how you feel about us when we're dealing with a large item like a housing needs analysis um, recommendation, um, do you feel that you're, you're like well apprised of, of what that document is um, is about? And, and I know you've got a lot of the work sessions. Do you feel there's gonna be a lot of conversation there where we should focus on those meetings just being specific? Um, housing needs analysis, um, economic opportunities analysis, those specific meetings, or um, if we kind of feel like some of these are smaller, shorter conversations, bringing those along. Because um, the clear, clear and objective standards, you're going to get a 294 page, you know, development code with just um, changes all, all throughout it. Um, and I don't know if that's going to be too overwhelming um, or you want us to take some of that, um, you know, kind of piecemeal to discuss it? Or is there a lot of faith that's been done in the consultants and the work sessions and the PowerPoint presentations that they've done where you feel pretty confident that um, your questions or inquiries have been um, already addressed? 
because I've gone through housing needs analysis where we've taken, you know, two or three meetings to go through them. Um, partially because they're just um, questioning certain things um, and, you know, have their own input. And uh, so we just kind of kind of wanted to gauge where you guys are at, kind of give us some feedback on how we have all of this. And then obviously we have the comprehensive plan um, policies, goals, and objectives that I know are going to come from that, um, that I would probably say have no code amendments on those discussions because they're kind of separate and keep our mind focused on, on separation between the comprehensive plan and the development code. But on the clear objective and housing needs analysis, um, economic, economic opportunities analysis, um, you mind just bringing some of these code amendments to you to, to discuss? We're just trying, like I said, trying to get some feedback. We don't, you know, we can certainly adjust this as we go along as well. So, um, you know, if you feel uncomfortable with, with some of these last work sessions that you're going to be involved with, I think even like, like next week's the housing needs analysis, if you guys feel like you got a really big grasp of that and don't feel like that's going to take up a lot of time or discussion during a meeting, um, we can, um, we can bring some of these other code amendments to discuss. They won't necessarily be a public hearing, like the uh, current objective and maybe the housing needs analysis as it goes forward in January. We can have just kind of discussions of these, like introductions. And then if we, if we come to a consensus on it, then we can just do the public hearing meeting or notice for the next meeting. So we won't be like having two public hearings at the same meeting, we'll, we'll have like our public hearing for um, some of these important plans and then we'll have maybe a discussion afterwards. But if you feel like that's like too much or maybe take us too late into the evening, um, we'll wait and see what the schedule is on some of these bigger plans and, um, and maybe introduce by different times, so. Yeah, and I mean, I think some of these code amendments we've entertained at making modifications to them for years now. Um, urban forestry standards, for example, we had like a subcommittee that kind of flopped, to be honest, and then COVID hit, so it never was enacted again. I didn't really feel personally it was a very good committee because how the council wanted it at the time was you know, have, have environmentalists on this committee and also have developers on this committee and kind of let them duke it out at the table. Well, it didn't really work. <laughs> you have people that want this, you know, only tree retention and people that only want to knock every tree down. How are they ever going to come to a middle ground? And they didn't. They never even got close to coming to a middle ground. So I, I think moving forward, I would just like the planning commission to discuss urban forestry and make those decisions and when we go to a hearing or a work session the public or or environmentalists whoever want to can come and speak at the podium to you and give you their thoughts but i think how we had it set up before was they were kind of the decision makers and the code the code never progressed so i i, I want to get away from that <laughs> i also think it's hard enough to staff or not to staff but to have boards and commissions that are volunteer based that have people committed to continue to come to those. I think it's really hard to, in addition to that, have other subcommittees. I mean, you, Jerry, you know, from serving on the comprehensive plan citizen advisory committee, mm -hmm. I have 15 members. And I think we have like four or five that actually show up on a regular yeah. basis. Yep. And so while I think the idea behind having all these subcommittees and other groups that meet is a great idea, I think in reality, people just aren't that interested in serving on those. So I think we have seven people <laughs> that I are very interested in serving and that are already on the commission. And you guys have more knowledge on how the tree code works or could work than I think this subcommittee could anyways. 
um, and you'll be the ones implementing it through development permits. So I think it just makes sense to have you guys review it. And so that's that's how I'm looking at proceeding with it. Um, I think, you know, just to go through a few of these other ones that, you know, Patrick put together a complete list on pages two and three. Um, there's a few on here that I know we talked about a decade ago, I think. I went back, I think, retaining walls and fences. I think we had like a work session in 2013 or 14. I found it. Yeah, so you were here, Jerry. I was here. Yeah, right. And we talked about like having retaining walls that are higher if they have a setback with the fence and everything. Patrick and I have been talking about it. And I don't know what happened. Uh, you know, maybe I dropped the ball on that. I don't really know, but it never moved forward. And so there was like a work session. We discussed it with the planning commission. I just found like the minutes and everything. <laughs> it's like after that, there's nothing. And I'm like, what happened to that? Like it just kind of fell off the map. And so there's things even like that that we we need to revisit. Like we get requests every year, dozens of them about, you know, oh, my property has a big slope on it. And therefore I need the retaining wall and fence height to be like two feet higher. Well, right now, the only way to do that is a variance procedure, which costs $1,600. They have to come before the commission. And so that I think there is there is some things in our code like that, for example, which I don't think is a practical way of doing business in Saudi with all our topography here. Um, so there's just things like that where we've, we've talked about them before. We, we need to come back together as a group and discuss some more. Um, there's some things on here that were more recently initiated by city council or city administration, like temporary use and structures. They want us to dive more into that. Um, the city council wants us to dive more into forf forfeitures and fees. Um, they want to increase the fees for non-compliance on code enforcement, and they want an escalation. So a lot of cities do this. So if it's like their 10th, 10th violation you're getting a fine for, it's going to cost you more than the first one is. It's basically the essence of it. And so a lot of cities already know that Sandy doesn't have that in our code. So if you're a repeat offender, you just get the same violation as the first time. Um, and then if you if you look through our um, procedures for code enforcement throughout the code, I think our new code enforcement officers identified like, I don't know how many, but I think it's somewhere in between 15 and 25 different procedures, depending on what code section you're in. That should probably be narrowed down to about three <laughs> so there, there's just a lot of work um in the code that needs to be done you know i think as patrick said kind of determining i think with the help of from you guys of how do we want to group these together do you want to see some of them like two or three at a time just some do you think are big enough probably like the urban forestry section that should be on the, its own um and then like patrick also said like we're going to be coming up with like Clear an objective on in January, comp plan stuff, HNA, uh, HPS that I know Jan, you're familiar with, the housing production strategy with House Bill 2003. We're going to be going through that process. And so we're trying to gauge like, are those meetings, should those meetings be set aside just for that topic? Or do you think there's some things on here that we could bring a code section to you on the same night? So we can kind of knock two things out at once since we're already meeting or already all here. Uh, and it may be that because we've, we've got a, a few new House bills, Senate bills. They're talking about introducing um, residential development in commercial districts mm -hmm. that we're going to have some um, uh, interaction, you know, that some some of this code work might start addressing that to because we're, we're forced to allow that and we're going to have clear objective. But how does that interact and how are they? Um, supposed to coexist, you know, without having any type of, um, you know, things that that maybe be in conflict with each other. So I think we'll start looking at some of those things too as we go forward um, because we have to, and that's gonna that's coming out of the clear and objective standards as well. So, yeah. um, and then there even I would just I wanted to bring this up because it was kind of interesting. When I was looking at one of the earlier um, uh, PowerPoints that the consultants did when we were talking about tree removal or urban foresty standards, um, 
just some simple fixes like adding new exceptions for tree removal from city owned parks and natural area for trail installation, maintenance, safety improvements. And the reason why I bring it up is because we had two land use plans where we charged Parks and Rec 800 bucks to review it because our the code required us to take them through that process when there could be some exemptions um, that again we would bring bring to you guys to see if you know they were valid or not. But you know, going between departments and certain um, situations where something needs to be expedited or, or get done, but they're held up because they have to go through um, a 14 day public note, you know, notice or something, um, where they can just do it on an administrative. So, be, I think a couple things like that that I think is just, you know, is is general housekeeping, but I think it it, it helps department, it will help the certain departments work together better and uh, faster. Um, on the sign code, if you look at that section, that has not been updated, I don't believe, since 2011. Um, I've been actually working off and on <laughs> because I never have enough time to really dive into it all the way, but I've been working it off and on since 2020. And I think we're at a point where I could basically bring some in the next couple months. It is awful. The sign code is awful. It's there's dozens probably of First Amendment violations in it um, mm -hmm. that I have not been enforcing since I've been the director. At least we've been ignoring them at the advice of our attorney. Um, but the sign code is just a dizzying. It's a, it's way more complex than it needs to be for both the people that live in town, sign companies that help those people, and even for my staff to administer like it really could be simplified. And so I know in the past when they've done site code revisions, they've only brought those to the city council. I don't think the planning commission's ever reviewed those. Mm -hmm. And that's because it's outside of chapter or title 17. However, this time going through it, I want planning commission to be, even if you're not as a commission, you're not making decisions on the sign code. I want your expertise and your advice on the code amendments. So I want to bring it to you for like, your recommendation of what you think and i want to get your feedback and then i'll bring it to council after but i think the city staff has really kind of missed an opportunity i would say to have a second review body kind of look at those standards <clears throat> in the past and i want to change that going forward um so going forward we're also going to have things come before you like if there's changes to dark sky ordinance or there's changes to the grading and erosion control section i want that all coming before you guys even though technically it doesn't have to, I want it to before it goes to the council um, so that we have an official recommendation from a body that they can then entertain and kind of analyze. I'm glad to hear you say that about the signs because as I read through it, it just seemed way too much. The sign code is, I don't want to be overly critical of whoever wrote it, <laughs> but it, it's been, it was written very poorly. I'll just yeah. be honest. And I think what happened is over time, different employees at the city tried their best to make modifications to certain sections to make it better. But as you probably know with codes, unless you do a comprehensive look at the whole thing, like one section of the sign code is now contradicting another section of the sign code because they won't, weren't updated at the same time. So it's, yeah, if you look, yeah. If you look at it and have questions, just ask because it's, a really poorly written code. Um, so we will be bringing that one. I I would, you know, it, from the recommendation section that Patrick put together on page three, that has some different questions for you guys to go through tonight. I would really prefer to move the sign code sooner rather than later because I do have something that's pretty close to a final product for you to see. Mm -hmm. And because I think it is so poorly done that I think it's a disservice to continue using this old code. I really do. Uh, I know my staff has been asking for the past two or three years if we can adopt the revisions. <laughs> so it's it's overdue, I would say. Um, so I don't know if you want to jump to page three to the recommendation section and kind of go through some of those questions. Um, No, no. So the first question is, are there any sections, and this is about the development code or the municipal code in general, so the entire municipal code, 
Are there any sections or chapters that are typically part of a design review or site plan review that you believe are too restrictive or maybe didn't go far enough to address the application? That's a good question. I, I, I find myself looking at it, man, what, what's in the code? You know? <laughs> Trying to, to uh, remember. So I know, just for an example, I know in the past, urban forestry was like a big one where I, I remember Ron, even Commissioner Lasowski, when he was still on here, saying like, we really need to change it because you remember for a while, every mm -hmm. subdivision had a variance request to it. And so like, Okay, so obviously something's not working and we need to solve it. Um, That's the one I was thinking of, because even still, it seems like 85, 95% of them do. Um, would this, would the purview of this also fall into maybe making it a little bit more user friendly, but also adding more teeth to it? Because it seems like right now, the penalty for not following it is pretty much what you're asking for when you come in for the variance anyway. So you go, oops, my bulldozer accidentally hit that tree. My bad. And then you just go and do what you want to do anyways. So maybe making it a little give and take on each side of it, making it something that's uh, more friendly to allowing the house to be built, but also you don't follow the rules. There's kind of some big consequences to it. I think both of those, yeah. Yeah. I would agree. <laughs> and Yes, we've we've had people accidentally, uh, and I say that with air quotes, uh, damage trees during development. That there's no way of proving that they did it on purpose, but I think there has been a few cases where they've done that cost benefit analysis and they determine well, it'll be a thousand dollars a tree. We'll, we'll pay it and move on. Yeah. Yeah, especially now that we have the ability to go out and enforce these types of things and look at them. You know, I've driven through things and go, that's no way is that fence that's leaning up against the tree, the proper distance around the root structure. I was like, no way is that actually being protected, you know? And so I think now's the time to adjust it that we can actually do something about it. I've also seen something too, and, that, and just want to maybe get a little kind of idea of what you guys are thinking of this. Um, because I've seen some some newer developments that we've gone out at. Kelly's taking me around to look at stuff. And um, some of the tree retention looks really odd because these trees are gorgeous. They're mammoths. They're giants. They're, you know, 70, 80, 100 feet tall. And there's two together in a, subdiv in a subdivision of could be 12, 12 lots, 15 lots. And they stand out. They're just two huge trees. And they were part of the tree retention of what they did because they were kind of maybe the only ones that were not where a building pad would go. So we're like, oh, we're going to save these two. Um, and some of them have got damaged. Some of them have died, um, just as you were saying, um, maybe on purpose or by, by nature. Um, but from my standpoint, just coming in, in, in from an outsider and, and looking at this, um, that I just I just don't see the benefit in having two hundred foot trees by houses. We're getting come, people that move in say, "Is this safe?" And um, arborists will say, "Sure, it's safe. You know, they're they're well established." But I've also seen in in multiple cases where once you take that tree stand away, they're a lot more vulnerable than you think because they don't have that wind break on them when they're when they're all together you got you kind of got that collective strength but when you take a lot of that away and so i'm just wondering if that's something that we look at as um and i don't know if it means maybe even losing a lot if, if we want to be that strict but i think you know losing a lot and keeping an actual tree stand for some open space area is better than having a whole development where they're only um, required to keep three trees and they keep three trees right in the middle and and similar things have happened just like that because I've been here a short time and what I've done maybe three four tree removal things and and it's I mean it it just doesn't make sense to me from being from an outsider I love trees I love to save them 
but it's got to be done logically. You just can't say, well, we're going to save trees. So we're going to save these two trees because they're not in a building pad. I would rather say you're doing a subdivision and we got 20% open space and you're going to have to lose a lot. You know, that's what it's going to take to save a, a strand of cheap trees that have a better success, better, you know, uh, success of surviving than two trees out in the middle of nowhere. Um, or not in the middle of nowhere, but in the middle of the, uh, of the subdivision. Uh, I mean, for, to me, it looks odd, <laughs> but I still think it's, it's not, I don't think it's um, just a prudent way to save trees. You know, I think you, you'll have more success if you group them together. And, and, and if you do that, as a lot of these, a lot of these developments are going in and you got one development and you got another one going right next to it, you got that opportunity to maybe somewhat um, pin these two areas of open space together to, to actually be more like a quantitative, useful uh, stand of trees rather than just sporadically one here, two here, three here. I mean, I'm not sure if, if I'm making saying that clearly enough, but just from an outstander uh, outsider, I've kind of seen that. And just it's like, yeah, these, you know. Do you think that would be a deterrent for developers or will we just be faced with more variance requests <laughs> if we say, because they're going to, oops, I knocked that one down, the rest have to go. Um, I mean, obviously the retaining wall, we've had that before where they want variances, but that's come across the desk several times in the last year. And I'm just wondering if we amend the codes to make them more strict and say, this is what it is. Are we just gonna keep getting those requests for variances over and over again? Or will they just go, okay, well, this is what's required. So this is what this is what we'll do. And it's kind of one of those things where we can change it and have different rules, but if they wanna push, they're gonna push and then. Well, they're, they're, right now, I think they're only required to save three trees per acre. So, you know, you can get, you know, eight, 10 lots per acre in there and saving three, you know, saving three trees. Um, yeah, they are, they are going to be kind of awkwardly placed. They're, they're just going to pick, pick the street, the three strategic trees that are not you know, in the location of where they want to build, put a building fat. Um, I mean, I don't mind making the developers jump through the hoops if that's what we require. Um, it just seems like we have the codes, they come, they want to do a variance. There's always a variance, a variance on top of a variance on top <laughs> of a variance. And so um, I, if we could lock it down a little bit more and maybe we would get a less, less push back and oh but can we just do these five trees oh but can we just do those five trees oh but there's 11 required but we want to take eight because it blocks what you require for the parking lot it's like a push and pull sort of thing with the rules um so i, I think it's a good conversation because i mean it could be where um i mean right now we do we do allocations for parkland they got to do a certain amount of area for parkland and, and we've been um you know doing the fee and lieu of that and moving certain parkland over to more consolidated area but we're keeping these three trees or something and i and i know there's i think i've heard that even uh, you know certain people are you know whether it's planning commission city council are very adamant about tree retention and we'll push back but i mean at some point saving three or saving three trees um you know is maybe not as prudent as requiring them to plant nine trees over here you know three for one or something because now you're going to have a place you know yeah you're going to lose a 70 foot tree but now you're going to get a place where you may have you know a group of trees that's gonna gonna stand there forever because there won't be no development there. That's gonna be part of a covenant. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of conversation to be had um, on this with different scenarios. And I, 
I think we probably need to have that discussion because, like I said, I, I think I think you get a lot of the we'll save these three trees, but the roots are damaged <laughs> in the development, you know, in the land balancing. Um, and I think you're going to see that over and over again. So what are we doing? You know, let's let's do it more proactively rather than reactively because it seems like we're, like we've reacted on like three different um, land use files lately for for uh, tree removal. And they're beautiful trees, but they're you know the ones we've been taking out. They were saved, but now they're they're dead and they're dangerous. When they're dying, they're even more dangerous. So uh, just something to think about. I think sometimes we, on that issue, we can lose sight of the goal, or or we have our own goals, as you were saying, saying Kelly. But to some, the goal is to never never cut a tree, ever. And um, others that, as you said, would would cut everything down. But I think that the to me, the the goal should be more of what. What is it that you want the, the look to be? I think for one thing on trees, we're all very impatient people and we'd much rather retain a hundred year old tree. And I'm not saying do that, but or that get rid of it, but retain it because planting a new one that's gonna be in a better place, better location, better look is perhaps beyond my lifetime and I'm not, I'm, I'm not uncomfortable with that. I think that's fine. My grandkids will enjoy it. But some of it, we just do it. So I, I like your thought about rather than necessarily trying to save everything is what's, what's the end product? What's the goal for this neighborhood to look like? And if it means that we plant new trees, that it's not going to look that way in 10 years. But in 30 years from now, Sandy's going to have a nice little place. And then nobody will want to cut those trees because they were placed there with some forethought. But yeah, it's what what what's our what are we trying to accomplish? And I think three trees per acre is way too little. I mean, I would that even when these are hundred foot trees, you know, hundred year old trees, I mean, um, you know, I think a developer would feel more comfortable knowing that if he's going to take down, you know, he, he gives us a tree survey. And if he's going to take down 50 trees, he's got to replace it with, he's either got to pay for it or, or replace it with, you know, 50 trees somewhere else. Um, and uh, every place, every city I've worked back in Michigan, it was minimum two and a half, three inch caliber. Every place I've been here, worked here in Benton County and then coming here is an inch and a half. I'm like, there's tree places out here that have two and a half, three inch trees. Let's make them give a little bit more start where they're, they're going to be, a little, you know, they have a little bit better chance and we'll take off. Maybe, and, and maybe that's something we discuss. And maybe we bring an arborist to, to back that up. I don't know if that, you know, is a good idea or bad. I've, I've seen it work. But again, all these trees, they... Any tree you plant's got a got a year or two year warranty on them, so if they die, you just replace them. But um, but I think if a developer knows something up front of what they need to do, it's easier for them to develop that um, and to try to maneuver their development around trees that you know they have to they're they're required to save rather than doing something that they can re, they can replace with more trees, you know. Because all they do is just factor that into their overall development, and it mm -hmm. and it pays off. So, um, but that's one topic. So we got yeah. we got lots <laughs> to, <laughs> to go over, and, and I see a lot of these will take, you know, a whole session to kind of go through and talk talk through. And maybe we do have some specialists, or maybe maybe at that point we have some some concerned citizens. So. Um, I, I think the tree, the urban forestry one is probably a set of meetings. Probably at least two work sessions would be my guess, maybe three. Because would that include um, 
like uh, commercial, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, visual blocking. Site buffering. Site yeah. Site. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, the buffering. It certainly could. I don't think it necessarily has to. That's one of the things I think that's come up, at least the majority of our commercial type projects that we've seen so far, or at least that I've seen so far. I mean, I think I think one of the problems with the tree retention standards that we currently have is there's no minimum lot size requirements associated with them. So you can do the you can do the two big trees on a six thousand or seven thousand square foot lot, which is a problem, obviously. And so I think I think part of the issue is like there's nothing in the code that relates tree retention and size of tree to minimum lot size, and I think that's. I think that's where it's kind of missing. Because what we get now is a lot of 7,500 square foot lots with 80 foot tall dug firs on them. And the dug firs 15 feet from the house foundation. <laughs> and the dig out went even closer. So yeah, of course the root zone has been compromised. So uh, I think that's one of the big issues to be honest, is like we're not relating our tree retention to lot size. <clears throat> So in addition, or so we know tree retention is one of them. I heard retaining walls, which I would agree that's, and that's on our list of like ones we want to look at further. Is there other ones that you can think of like during subdivisions or even the park review that we did recently or any, or any other reviews since any of you have been on here? Jerry's been on here so long with this by lots, but. Yeah, I gotta remember. <laughs> <laughs> so are you thinking that there's some that might be quick to do? I was thinking like, drive-through requirements, that's probably a lot easier. And um, <coughs> maybe even the cell towers, I don't know how complicated that would be. I would agree. I think both those are on the easier to-do list. Yeah. So maybe we could wipe out a couple of those easy ones. It would be nice to dwindle the list down quicker, I think. Kind of a small victory. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, hey, we had like 10 things and we got like five of them done in the first like six months. Now, how how does this um, play out time wise with the clear and objective? In other words, if some of the, if, if we're looking at existing code that has been analyzed on the clear and objective but hasn't passed, would, would the code that you be bringing to us? Have the clear and objective changes if they're they are present as well as the, the changing in the verbiage or so the clear the clear objective will be coming before you in January. So that will be the main thing to look at that night. Like we're not going to bring one of these with a okay. So that that uh, ideally will be behind us at that point. It, it will hopefully go before city council for adoption in February. So hopefully when we're bringing more to you. The hope is is that that's kind of all done that's, that's adopted oh, okay. and it's mostly pertaining to residential too clear the, the most to, yeah to residential. that's true i mean we're still going to probably look look at these through that lens you know because that's i mean that's the best way to get a good mm -hmm. code is, is to make a clear objective but the, the whole clear and objective um audit was mostly based on residential okay so um house bills and stuff so um, <coughs> this would be a little bit outside of that but but i think it's going to be that same philosophy of lens mm -hmm. or lens to look through we'll kind of okay. do our own clear objective yeah absolutely. It, it is a good point though because like urban forestry for example that does have some clear and objective modifications on that code section and then even like the one that patrick brought up the tree removal for parks maintenance exemption so there will be some things like if you looked at the code today and you start using that it's already old because it doesn't incorporate the changes mm -hmm. we're going to be bringing. Well, it sounds like you wouldn't be bringing any of those to us until after the clear and objective that's cleared anyway. I, I agree. I think to Commissioner Weinberg's point, the, the clear and objective audit didn't touch major utilities, salt towers. It didn't touch drive throughs So those two chapters were untouched by it. I, I, I'm pretty sure mm -hmm. um, it didn't touch so signs. So like those kind of chapters, we can yeah. move forward with them, even if that's not adopted yet. Mm -hmm. Hey, we have something to do on Christmas now. <laughs> <laughs> you really want to meet on Christmas or something. <laughs>
So any of these adaptations of these codes going forward with the legislative bills with the affordable housing and the imposition of residential zoning wherever, I know you've said we've got inquiries from <clears throat> Colorado, I believe in the past. How can we, if it's something we're interested in doing, kind of build around to kind of make it less appealing, I suppose, to kind of be forced almost to adapt to the legislative laws without losing our say in development of the city? Is, that, is there any path going forward where we can kind of not change it, but kind of steer around so we get a say, even if the state forces us to enforce these certain things? I think that's where my focus will be, where I would hope that maybe by amending some of these or changing them or rewriting them, that we could kind of retain just a smidge of control <laughs> and say in our own city yeah. of what's being forced upon everyone. The only thing I know of for exemptions are you have to relate it back to um, environmental protection. So you could always increase your buffers to creeks and wetlands. You can increase, and they do, I did talk to the state about this, they do consider true retention in environmental regulation. Okay. Um, hillside protections, because that's for like landslides and stuff like that. We so saw you, that you definitely can do that. Didn't we? Yeah, you definitely can do that. They, um, the one I would really encourage the city to move forward on at some point is creeks and wetland protections. Because those are where kind of our best ecosystems exist anyways locally. And the state's been very clear that that is one of the few limitations we can still do with all the new hospitals. The, the other one is historic districts, uh, but Sandy doesn't have one, so. And we wouldn't qualify. You saw it, you saw it in my eyes. Um, we don't have any, we don't have like a district like Silverton or like, um, we just don't have enough historical housing to qualify for district. I actually worked in a city before that had a district, Coburg. Um, and I think, I think every, I think it was two out of every three houses at the time, at least, were considered historic. So built prior to, I think, 1932 or something like that. So Sandy doesn't, <clears throat> we might have like 50 houses that were built prior to that in the whole city limits, mm. but are still standing. <laughs> One other thing that might play into the forestry is I know there are, are new rules uh, for the setbacks and so forth under the Forest Practices Act. And mm. I don't know how much of that would apply to a city. I don't think it would, but you that would be a good like area to, to look at what they're implementing and then seeing how, what out of that we want to implement, yeah. hopefully. Might just have some problems along Tickle Creek. Right. I don't think we've mentioned it a lot, but I've heard it come up a few times at city council, but uh, lot sizes and setbacks. <clears throat> I don't know if that's something we really want to, if you really want to dig into. <laughs> um, I just know it's something that has come up. I don't have a particular desire to, because I've, I know there's pluses and minuses to it. And, so the two things, so you'll learn a lot more about that on December 4th. Okay. But what I can tell you is, so you you all know about Measure 49 claims, I think, at this point. Like, somebody could do a takings claim. Yeah. In addition to that, this the legislature, in, in, I think you know about this, is likely to pass House Bill 3414, which is called, some people are calling it the Variance Bill. It's basically going to make lot sizes an organ minimum lot size in Oregon cool. not applicable anymore. Cool. Well, the governor will be pushing some new things in the short session starting in February. Yeah. So I, I've been told House Bill 3414 is like 95% chance passing at this point. Like it's it's basically going to be passed. Like they, I think they've already done some work to determine who's going to vote against it and there's just not the numbers to turn it down, I don't think. So that 
with Sandy could do a lot of work on minimal lot sizes, setbacks. Once House Bill 3414 is passed, we have to grant the except we have to grant the variances for setbacks and lot sizes. Like we can still make them go through the variance procedure, <laughs> but we can't deny it. So that yeah, you, you'll learn more on December 4th from Kerry Richter, who's um going to be presenting to the Planning Commission and City Council, and she's going to be talking about that bill. Um, yeah. Like duplexes, they no longer consider attached. They can be detached. Well, we already have that in our code, yeah. yeah. This bill is like the variance bill, though. It, it was even more aggressive like a year ago, and then they kind of stripped it down a little bit to appease some people that didn't want to pass it. Um, but I've heard it's at the point now of likely going to be passed. <laughs> Maybe lower on the list then. <laughs> now, if it's not passed, then I think we could look at that more. But I think if it's passed, my advice, and I think you'll hear from the attorneys I'll be speaking to, is it, there wouldn't be a lot of sense in passing it at that point. Because the legislation would just overrule it. <laughs> so that I'm, I'm sure when we start talking about that next Monday night, that's going to be... Um, an interesting conversation. I think that will be a very interesting conversation. We're we're hoping to probably spend a good twenty minutes or thirty minutes talking about that bill coming up because that's for housing. Like Patrick was talking about, it's not going to really matter what the code says on that kind of stuff. I don't know how it applies to density yet. Just so you know. I don't know much about that. I have to read up on that. Okay. But is it from what what you gather? Is are they? Is it going to open up more developments of like townhouses, like attached? You know, uh, I they can be individually like separate. You know, separated. Potentially, um, I think. I think the thrust of the bill is, from what I can read, from what I've read, and may, maybe you have a different opinion, Jan, on this, but it's basically to allow for more housing in the same area so it's kind of like piggybacking off of house bill 2001 it's like you know if we have a minimum lot size of 7500 and the developer comes in and wants to do all the lots at 6000 and it's allowing them to put basically more houses on the same pad site so i don't know if it's really specifically going to allow different or will promote different uses or even lower the cost of housing i don't know if it'll do either one of those things but it would allow more houses on the same amount of land. And what about um, lot frontage, like frontage to a, to a public right of way? Yeah, I think we can get a variance to that too. <laughs> yeah, we'll get we'll a variance or is it automatically on? Like, well, that, that's what I think we can still charge for the variance. Um, I don't know. We'll have to see how it all plays out. But we're going to start allowing. Houses to be built behind houses to be built behind houses, <laughs> and then you got an easement going through all the lots. Probably they just keep separating, and they don't have to have any frontage. That's what I've I've told other people that the state is trying is just getting us to put more and more people on less and less dirt. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I I get the point of some of the bills. I'm not saying I agree with them or don't agree with them. I've yet to see any cases, though, that it's actually lowered the cost of housing. It, it could produce more housing, which maybe that is the ultimate goal. I don't know. But I have heard some people at the state level say it's going to lower the cost of housing through like a supply and demand model, which hypothetically it will do. But I haven't seen that in the last four years since House Bill 2001 was adopted. Like housing prices have just gone up. There's been no decrease in housing costs. Well, it only decreases when your demand decreases. And if your demand's not, if you can't build enough to meet, to make your demand decrease, which you can't right now, it's not gonna do anything. It's still gonna be high. What I hear the builders saying at some of those hearings is the state should help pay for some infrastructure because that's where the cost is really coming in. and. 
you know, the State Water Resources Department is shutting down on groundwater permitting. So cities are up in arms and they can't get new permits for groundwater, but the governor is pushing them for all this additional housing. Interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, that's what I hear from local developers too, is it's not how many lots, it's not, it's not more of a, I, it's more of an infrastructure thing. It's like the permitting costs and SDCs and everything. Like since I've worked here, they've doubled. Like to get a permit of our counters doubled. That's more of their concern than how many houses they can put on the one acre of land. What's, I hear the same thing locally. Um, one other thing that Patrick put in here, I, I thought I'd just touch upon real fast is this. I'm not even sure if all of you are aware of this. Um, when Sandy style was implemented in 2008, I, I believe this was an oversight. I could be wrong. It, you might have more of a background to it, Jerry, but I believe it was an oversight. Um, there is no relation between size of building and Sandy style. So right now, if you took, and we have not taken it to this degree, but if you looked at the Sandy style section 1790, in like the commercial zones, let's just use for example, if you build a 200 square foot structure or a 200,000 square foot structure, the design requirements are the same. And so what, what, where that really becomes a problem, like roof slope, maybe a little bit, materials a little bit, um, but where it really becomes a problem is we require like all the faux stone, all the additional elements. And so like the Ace Hardware did that on that new structure, it looks beautiful over there. But that little structure also costs a hundred thousand dollars to build. Wow. Um, and where we kind of looked the other way on that, I'll just be very honest, is by Sandy style, that structure should have had windows too. Because there is no exemption for accessory structure and related to size. Now, John Miller, the guy at ASI told him, we're, we're not gonna require windows on a building that's not even against the road and that you have building supplies and like someone's gonna bust in there and steal it all. So he was very appreciative that we didn't require that. But if we would have just taken the code very strictly as it's written, it would have had windows and all in it too. So there's just even little things like that where I think it was not intentionally done in 2008. I think it was just not, I think it was an oversight. So there's things like that, that we, we believe Patrick and I believe it really need to be changed as well. So requiring a certain amount of Sandy style to a square footage on the frontage area. Yeah, and I, and I think the building materials would still be the same, maybe even the roof pitch, or maybe it's a little bit less, but like not requiring windows on a storage shed and not requiring faux stone on a, you know, a building that you might be able to see from the right away, like the little one at Ace, but it's 100 feet plus off the road, like, I don't know. And obviously we'll just be bringing recommendations to you on what we think works, but I think that's a good one that we should explore uh, in 2024 sometime. One, uh, one question you did ask, I know is whether <laughs> for some input on prioritizing a list and we've kind of, um, I don't know that we've helped with with specific well maybe so some of the quicker ones could be done together um, but i'm looking at the list i'm wondering if it wouldn't be good to give consideration to those that were initiated by council and administration should they be moved to a higher priority yeah i would agree yeah. i mean i even if they're bigger ones, you know, the forestry one is, is a big one, but if that was initiated by city council, then we probably should I would agree. get it done a little bit sooner than later. You know, something like that. We, we would only bring it on a month that we don't have a public hearing or something that right. we're going to do. So if we got that opening, you know, and again, we're not going to throw a public hearing right at you again. These are going to be work sessions or you know, discussions through them. Um, it will be like, uh, you know, fillers, kind of, you know. It's kind of where we're telling you, you pr probably after December, we're going to meet every month. To start filling these in, yeah. Yeah, I, I every so. single month we're going to be meeting. Um, and 
And uh, I mean, I, have, have you always just had one one meeting per month? Yeah, I mean, we've done one we've scheduled done. meeting. And actually, I was just going to say that um, I'll probably get shot, but <laughs> that we we could. I'm just speaking, you know, don't don't hesitate to throw out the idea for a second meeting if it's a workshop oriented one. Uh, to, to answer your question, we have in the past, we have met twice a month, but it's usually almost always caused by a continuation that we had had to get done or we we had to continue it, continue it sooner because we, the, the next month was already loaded and those that's what was causing those. But in a more of a relaxed thing, I, I just say, you know, don't don't hesitate to throw out the idea. And if we can't make it work, we can't make it work. But I always like the idea of doing it like in the in the slower months, like first part of the year. Once you get to summertime, you don't want to do it because everybody's on vacation. Right. It's, sometimes it's even hard to get a quorum. But when everybody kids are in school, parents are our home. Those the weather's are, crappy. Weather's <laughs> crappy. You know, more of an opportunity than, than certainly. But yeah, come June, no way. You know, yeah. back to the. And I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that we'd be open to do it two every month. You yeah. know, January, February, March, April. <clears throat> but maybe once or twice after the first of the year. Just. Well, you know, know. Know. Others may say absolutely not, but that seems like you've been doing the between the, the meetings and the work sessions. You've been you've been quite busy with those. Yes, here. the work this kind of a, a lot. odd period right now with the comprehensive plan that's throwing in a lot of work session. And there will be a few more on that still, just so you're aware. Um, and I, you know, I this is a volunteer based commission, so I I try to be cognizant of that. Mm -hmm. um, I also some months already have four night meetings, so my wife would kill me if I had a fifth one or six one. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, I think actually once last year around budget, I had six night meetings in one month and that was like way too much for me at least. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, if, like if there's a month where we don't have anything on council agenda too, and we want to power through some of this, I'd be open to that as well. Yeah. And even um, if, if it were, um, we knew it was going to be short, mm -hmm. you know, we knew it could be a two hour meeting. So I, my guess is maybe this is a good question for the group. Do, would you prefer as a group if they're like two, two and a half for a meeting, so we're out by nine? Would you prefer to have like two of those in a month or one that goes to 11? Okay, me too. Yeah. After about 9.30, I'm kind of done, just to be honest. Right, right. And you get, it, it, well, though you were not talking necessarily public hearings, but in a public hearing, when it starts getting 10 or 11, you... You, you, you don't want to be there, and yet you know to so cut it short, you're doing a disservice to the applicant, and it's a, it's a tough one. And yet we're all kind of losing our sharpness by then. Okay, that's what, that's what, that's what I feel too, so I was, I was wanting to make sure I was not alone on that. Mm -hmm. In the same way, but if, you know, it's... We can get this done if we stay till nine thirty. Oh well, yeah, totally chill with that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, definitely agree with that. I was just saying. I I know when I first started here, there seemed to be a lot more meetings that went really late, and I know we tried to get away from that over time. Mm -hmm. um, there's even some commissioners over the last ten years that were saying, well, "Let's just continue. Like once it hits ten thirty, let's stop." Yeah, and I think we did a better job of doing that yeah. over time. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, I always tell the story about we. We have at least one set of minutes that span two dates. Yeah. I think you have at least two, because I think one of those happened last year. Okay. One went to like a quarter to one in the morning. And that's like, that's not productive. No. No. Okay. So we're all in agreement on that. Mm -hmm. It seems a little worrisome to me as we're in the middle of our clear and objective ordinance changes and comp plan and in. February, the legislature is going to come back for 35 days and do more. <laughs> Keep skirting around the edges. Yeah. I mean, I think, so Patrick pointed out this earlier. I, I would agree, though, that whenever we can make it clear and objective, I think we should. Mm -hmm. I think that 
allows everybody to know what the expectations are. Now, when it's like design standards, it's really hard to write them clear and objective. So there's going to always be some discretion in there. Uh, but I, I do agree with Patrick that I think even if the state's not requiring it for like commercial development, I think when we can, we should make it clear and objective. Because um, if they aren't requiring it now, they may soon. Well, I, I think, Jerry, you've been on here long enough that even we've had people come up and joke at the podium that, you know, when the code says something like encourages, I think we've even had applicants say, well, thank you for encouraging me, but <laughs> we're not going to do that. <laughs> so I, I just think wording like that, while I, I get why it was put into codes, I, th I think eliminating that kind of wording is probably good. Mm -hmm. Those are the words that the attorneys just yeah. <laughs> let this go right straight yeah. to. But have you gotten the answers to your questions this evening? That I think so. I mean, I, I think part of it um, is going to be playing it by ear. Um, obviously, not wanting to overload you and 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 just feeling kind of cognizant of of. When the when the housing needs analysis when these all start kind of hitting um, because if there's just going to be the one meeting a month you know at first um, the focus is going to be on all of this stuff getting it through um, but if we get through a couple and and uh, you know we see that they're going relatively quickly or or. The works the work sessions have got you to a point where you're very comfortable and you're recommending and, and those meetings go a lot quicker then we'll we'll maybe start bringing your package or, or maybe suggest bringing you know having a second meeting somewhere somewhere in there um, that lines up I mean these code changes because the clear and objective is all code change code changes so code amendments so just like these so as as we go to do a formal adoption of it too um, you know, uh, they can be grouped together that way as well, I think. Or that's, no, that's actually a good point. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, if we, no, that's a really good point. So, yeah, if we have different work sessions and then we determine we want to group quite a few of them for the hearings, we can do that as well, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just because they weren't grouped together at a work session doesn't mean they can't right. be at a hearing. Mm -hmm. That's actually, yeah, that's a really good point. Well, yeah, I, I think just playing it by ear. I think we just wanted to kind of... Um, probably already knew and maybe it was just let's just be a little bit more over cautious and letting you know there's a lot coming this year certainly um seems like to me from from being being new um i've gone through a lot of this stuff and it, it's um some of it goes really quickly some of it really takes a lot of uh attention to detail and and conversation um on the policies especially i think you guys are going to have a lot of input on that i know I, from my understanding, I know the, the consultants are going to be bringing a lot of that to the table, but I, I hope that doesn't restrain anybody from you know from looking at it from your perspective and adding more to it, you know, adding more value to it or bringing something completely new that's been missed. So there's going to be a lot of that too. So it's not going to be just you know, oh, thanks for thanks for giving this to us, and yeah, you know, we agree, and let's you know take a vote. Um, a lot of it's going to be very uh, full and and um, you know full meeting going over this review and so yeah I think part I think part of what we wanted to do tonight is just kind of have a little bit of a conversation let you know this is kind of what we're thinking about as like a work plan for the next year or maybe year and a half even um, because you know there are going to be other competing interests with this work um, so like the housing production strategy whatever comes out of future legislative sessions. And if we need to do code adoptions with that, the comp plan. Um, a mass timber. Okay. Mass timber plan, yep. Mass timber code. And then, you know, hopefully, as, as we talked about about an hour ago, hopefully within the next six months, there's going to be some modifications to the moratorium. And hopefully we'll have the opportunity to start receiving some land use submissions again. And what that will mean is more public hearings around those submissions. Um, so as, as Patrick said, it's gonna be kind of, these, these code updates are gonna be kind of where we have time, but we just wanted to kind of start to have a dialogue with the commission on, here's what we're kind of thinking of now. 
what's your input on it? And, you know, it doesn't need to just be tonight either. If other people think of um, things after tonight and you want to email those to Patrick and I, we can kind of see where that would fit into this. And so if, you know, if you go home and in a few days you think, oh, this is something that's really been coming up the last few times, or, hey, have we ever looked at addressing this part of the code? Please send it to us and we can look into it more and have a discussion with you. Um, the, only, the only thing I caution on that is, um, <coughs> you know, if you want to include like um, Jerry and Jan on that, that'd be great since they're the chair and vice chair right now. I wouldn't include any more people than that just because then we run into potential forum issues if it becomes kind of a conversation in the email. Um, but yeah, I think it's just to kind of start this dialogue let you know, here's kind of what we've been thinking about as far as the next year for work plan. Yeah, it's good to hear. Um, I know we haven't really actually had like just a work session about future code edits, and I, I don't think a couple of years actually. I don't even remember when the last time was. We haven't had the time. Haven't, no. Um, but yeah. The luxury. Do we know enough right now to, to put together like a, a tentative schedule for the next meetings? Not, not even like putting this even aside, but the H&A, the, the EOA. Oh, yeah. yeah, we could definitely the, try to do that. The comprehensive plan, the, you know, just, just a tentative thing of like when we think they're going to come. Yeah, we could definitely try to put some together and let you guys know what we, it would be tentative. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, and ultimately with the city council ones with like the work sessions, I, you know, I need to get that approved by the city manager and the, the mayor. Uh, I mean, usually it's fine. We usually go with it, but um, that, you know, our stuff at the planning level has competing interests with all the other stuff they're doing at the city level. Uh, but yeah, we could, I think that's a great idea to put together kind of a tentative uh, timeline for at least the first half of 2024 so you kind of know what's coming down the line. And, may, and maybe even actually we could maybe sneak a few of these in there. Um, I think I would like to do that. Could be, yeah, I mean, maybe when we our first meeting in January, maybe introduce something to you. And then some of some of these plans, or you know, where you feel more comfortable. You know, like oh, we can get through this relatively quick. We understand it. We you know kind of know where we stand. Or this is really confusing. We want to have more discussion about it. Yeah, have some appetizers to the main course. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it'll be interesting. I don't know for the January meeting. Just so you're all aware, I probably should have put this in the update. It's like I think of these things after <laughs> we're, well, we're at the meeting. Because of the nature of the clear and objective audit, we've determined that most zones need a measure 56 notice about the code changes. And so instead of just excluding a few industrial zones, we're just going to mail everybody in city. So every single property owner um, will get a mailed notification of the clear and objective audit changes. So you'll be getting one in the mail. And so that will go out to over 4,000 properties. You know, there's quite a few people that own multiple properties. So I don't know, probably 3,500 different property owners, what my guess would be. Um, so based on that, you know, a certain percentage, probably 90%, will just probably toss it in the recycling bin. But out of, you know, that 10 or 15% that take the time to read it and maybe think through it. I, I don't know what kind of potential uh, attendance we could get in January. I just don't know. I have no idea. We could get nobody. We could get a filled room. I have, I have no idea. Just so you, it's just so you wear don't fancy clothes. What's that? Wear our fancy clothes just in <laughs> case. <laughs> yeah, Texas sure. and I'm not a very fancy clothes type person as you probably can see. So mm -hmm. um, I'll probably be dressed similar, but yeah. It might be it might be a busy in here. I don't I don't know. I have no idea. All right. The uh, workshop Monday six o'clock. Six. Yeah, I believe that's the case. Yes. And do they have a regular? Is it only an hour or is it two hours? <laughs> two hours. Okay. So six p.m. is two hour work session. Yeah, and so so just so you kind of know what's going on with that, I've been putting it together. So about the first 45 minutes will be an overview. Well, the first about 30 minutes will be an overview of the housing capacity analysis. 
just so you're all aware, the state had to do this, of course. They were always called housing needs analysis, so HNA. About a year ago, they changed it to a HCA, a housing capacity analysis. Why? I have no idea. But no, so now it's, you'll probably see it in the packet. It's called an HCA. It's the same thing as an HNA. There's no difference. So that will take up about the first half an hour of the presentation. And then there'll be like some questions. And so that'll be about the first 45 minutes. And then we have about the next hour, hour and 15 dedicated to Carrie Richter, who's a land use attorney. She used to work for Barry Ilsner and Hammond, our attorney's office back in 2002, 2003. And she is hired a lot of times by 3J, our comprehensive plan consultant. So they hired her to come in and explain recent legislation, anticipated legislation, kind of limitations of what we can do with housing policies. So that when we take the HCA and move it forward to creating policies for the comp plan in like the block three, that planning commission city council have kind of a better understanding of Based on legislation and court cases, this is kind of how we're limited. So that that's why it's a two-hour work mm -hmm. session. Because you'll be hearing from basically two different presenters. Anything and else? yes, it begins at 6 p.m. Sure. Right. I had a question for you on the sign ordinance. I was noticing that there's supposed to be a sign review committee. Do we actually have a sign review committee? So we don't. <laughs> <laughs> so when I when I started here, we had a <clears throat> sign variance committee. And then we also had an A-frame sign committee. Participation was always difficult. <laughs> <laughs> so shortly after I became the director in the department, I asked the mayor and the city manager at the time, can we basically just not have those anymore and just refer everything to the city council? And that's how we've done it the last seven years. <coughs> is if there's a sign variance request or any sign thing where they want an approval that I can't grant, we just bring it to council. And we get maybe one every year, about one a year. So it's, it was just, it's another example of it's just really hard to maintain all these different committees. And sometimes I think moving forward for the sign code, what I'd recommend is actually variance so to come before the commission instead of the council, just to remove like that from the responsibilities and granted bestow that power to you. That'd Any be a discussion about bringing the sign ordinance into Title 17. Uh, the only problem with that is then it can be subject to a LUBA appeal. <laughs> That's why it's never been brought in. Because then it's, we talked to our attorney about that several years ago and he didn't want to do it because uh, that's why a lot of cities don't have it in their development code is then it can be subject to a LUBA appeal. And then else can we move out of 2017? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> there probably is something, I'm sure. <laughs> That's why a lot of cities never put their like dark sky ordinance into their development codes either, but it's what I was told. Um, or like their erosion control standards. That way it could be heard by an appeals officer, but not by Lula. Yeah, yeah there, there very well could be something we can move out of it. I hadn't really thought of that, but there could be something. Very well. Any other final questions from either, either up here or over there? So from everybody's um, background, since I'm fairly new, so would the most important ones of these be the urban forestry standards and um, the retaining walls and fences as a priority to work on first, would you say? or? Well, we kind of mixed it up by saying that some of the smaller ones could come first yeah. that aren't, that we wouldn't say are necessarily a, um, a higher priority based on the content, mm -hmm. but they are because of the size. So right. we kind of mixed up the priority. Six months to start the first one. 
it just seems right. that urban forestry standards is going to be a lot of conversation. Forfeitures and fees yeah. help. Yeah. From what I can tell. Get, um, get Chris going. Mm -hmm. He's working on today. And with the current situation, this might not be the best. Yeah. 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 Like what you were saying, Jerry, yeah. just look at the more long term of what the look and feel of the neighborhood would feel like rather than looking at the three trees. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think you I can. Think lots of, yeah. I, I, so, what I would say, I think that's a great question, and I think it's very pertinent. What I would say is right now, because of the moratorium, the likelihood, even with a modified moratorium, of having like a lot of subdivision applications is going to be very low. The likelihood of continuing to get sign permits and small accessory buildings, like the one A's put in, is going to remain relatively high because they're not restricted at the moratorium by the moratorium. So while I while I agree with uh, Commissioner Vincent that the tree one would typically be the most important, I think we're kind of in a unique circumstance because the moratorium is not going to allow subdivisions middle school. Oil. Now, in saying that, I think the retaining wall and fences is very applicable and should be looked at soon. Because people are like signs, people are always looking to put retaining walls and fences at their house. So, and I'm not I'm not trying to minimize the importance of urban forestry. I just think it's likely to have less impact in the next six months to year because of the moratorium restrictions than some of the other sections mm -hmm. right now. That's yeah, what it's I would time. say. It is because that typically. In past years, when I worked here, the urban forestry thing is definitely the thing that comes up the most in the commission. Do you foresee the moratorium going further than another six months? Is that something? Yes, that... I think it'll be modified from what it currently states. But yeah, I don't. I don't think there'll be a full lift. Okay. Yeah. I think it'll be. You know, with how the moratoriums work, it's not actually. A modification to the moratorium it's actually a new moratorium just so you know like the because state law only allows us to extend moratoriums when you actually have any changes to the resolution it's actually considered a new moratorium i know it's kind of bizarre but that is how it's done at the state level so the one they just extended on november 20th was an extension because they didn't make any changes to the resolution we're hopeful that with the negotiations with the EPA and DQ, that when we have the next moratorium change, it will just be a new moratorium with new uh, with new findings, essentially, and new restrictions. Maybe a priority list. Yeah, potentially, yeah. Okay. Everybody get their questions answered. We'll see everyone, or we'll see those that can make it Monday, Monday. And if there's nothing else, we will adjourn. And one request, if you can't make it on Monday, if you can just let me know, the mayor is wanting to have more of an accurate count of who's going to be there ahead of the meeting. So okay. if I don't hear from you, I'll just assume that you're going to be there. But if you're not going to be there, if you could let me know, just so I can let him know. Very good. Thank you everyone for, for coming. See you, Chris.